Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event where we're going to uh, launch the SAFCA VC Industry Survey for 2021. I'm Tanya van Lul, I'm the CEO of SAFCA, I'm also your host for this afternoon. Last month, we launched the highlights of the survey. Today, we're launching the full report uh, to give you a sense of what the uh, investment activity uh, within the industry was like for the year of 2020. Um, now our focus for today's discussion um, is on exits and lessons learned. And here uh, to host the session, we've got Karen Jean's uh, portfolio management partner at Edge Growth with us. But before I hand over to her, just a, a quick uh, note, we've got a competition running today. And we're asking you, our participants and our audience, to send through statements that you would like to know whether our panelists agree or disagree with those statements. The most interesting statement, um, and we'll do this at, at the end of uh, today's proceedings, uh, will win a virtual ticket to the SAFCA VC conference taking place on the 15th of November. An example of a statement could be, uh, there will be more exits next year than there were this year, and then we can see whether the panel agrees or disagrees. So please remember to send that through. We'll also post uh, the link to the full report that you can download uh, towards the end. Uh, but here today to discuss the report and some of the findings and specifically exits and lessons learned um, is our host, Karen Jeans. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand over to you um, and you can lead the proceedings. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, and welcome all. Um, we have a great session planned for you this afternoon. Um, just a reminder, you can earn one CPD point for attending the session, but you do have to stay for the whole hour, um, but it's definitely going to be worth it. And we've got a, a great panel and a great lineup set uh, out for you. So to kick us off, we have Stephen Lambracht, who is a professional strategy and workshop facilitator at VS Nova and is Savka's research partner, research partner in putting uh, the survey together. So over to you, Stephen. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, um, Karen. Okay, um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, just a second. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly just remind you of, of uh, some of the areas that we covered in the highlights um, where we released uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, again, 2020, this, uh, the SAFCO survey covers the 2020 calendar year. Um, and again, we had quite a, a record number of investments um, up again from the previous years, as you can see. And, and incredibly also, if you go and look, compare the last five years with the previous five years prior to that, um, I mean, 5.6 billion rand just in the last five years alone. Uh, and the figure in 2011 to 2015 for that five years was only 1 billion rand. Um, so we've had eight consecutive years of growth. And this despite the pandemic, this despite the economy, um, and that is quite encouraging. So in 2020, we recorded 1.39 billion rand, two entities through 167 different investment rounds. Um, we're going to talk about exits later, but we had an increase in exits as well, two thirds of which were, was reported as profitable. Okay. Um, in terms of the number of deals, again, vast majority of deals go into startup capital, which is encouraging from an entrepreneurial startup point of view. Um, and then independent fund managers feature predominantly in the, in the majority of those deals. Uh, the public sector still holds quite a large number of or investors that have uh, drawn their money from the pri uh, public sector. Um, but as last year, as you can imagine, a lot more money went into own portfolios than in previous years. And some of the investors reported making available some of their funding to assist some of their portfolio companies to survive COVID. Um, and as a result of that, not doing as many new deals um, and rather putting money into existing transactions. Sector is still very much, and I think this mimic also what we're seeing in the rest of, of the world, um, where there's more and more money going into those sectors that deal with service delivery also in the, in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so also in our country, seeing a uh, focus around um, health, uh, consumer products and services, business products and services, and fintech. And a lot of those are underpinned by software. So fintech alone up 71% from last year, um, which continues to grow into, into quite a, 
a sizable focus um, in South Africa. But digitization is the underlying factor that, that's in a lot of the investments. And again, that mimics um, what we're also seeing in the rest of the world. Average deal size, and there's quite a, a big difference there. Some of the deals as much as 100 million rand into a single deal. But on average, we're talking about 9.5 million rand. Um, that in some sectors like business and products where we're talking about software enablement and web services and, and uh, software as a service, the amount of investment is not as much, so lower than a 9.5 million average. Okay, um, again, as in previous uh, startup ecosystem, very much concentrated in two places, predominantly um, Gauteng and the Western Cape. Johannesburg still features as the, the uh, head office location for most of the fund managers. Um, but by far, the vast majority of deals, uh, especially in the pandemic year as well, have gone towards companies that are based in the Western Cape. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through too much more things to be discussed and disclosed during the panel conversations, um, but you can download uh, that includes a lot more analysis, um, as well as a lot of uh, data related to fund managers and their preferences, um, as well as the list of participants in the back. Uh, some of those that wanted to be disclosed as contributing data to this year's report. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for that. Um, so let us introduce our panelists to you. So to start off with, uh, we have Kiet van Sale, who is the founder, co-founder and partner at Night Capital. We then have Ian Lessem, uh, the managing partner at Havayak and Zule Furin, the founder and chief energy officer at Locum Base. So welcome all. Um, I wonder if we can start, maybe not everyone knows who you are, if you can give us a little one to two minutes of where you're from, what you do, uh, a little intro to our attendees. Kiet, if you could go first. Good, excellent. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All good? Okay, excellent. Hi everyone, Kiet van Sale. I'm a co-founder and, um, and partner at Knife Capital. We're a growth equity fund that sort of look at um, post-seed, post-revenue businesses and help them to scale across Africa and internationally where we can. Been in the, been in the business for a while and it's been, a, been really fun. But um, yeah, we've got a accelerator. We've got a sort of series A fund. We're launching a series B fund. And um, ultimately, just want to partner with the right uh, scale-up businesses and continue to do what we love to do. Awesome, thanks, Kit. Uh, Ian. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm Ian Lessam, the managing partner at Havaik. Uh, we are an early-stage, high-growth African technology investor, where we focus on investing in African startups that solve real-world problems and use technology to scale both locally and abroad. Um, with investments headquartered in South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya, servicing over 3 million customers in over 180 countries across the globe, through our investments, we very much live our mantra, which is local innovation and global innovation. Um, it's great to be here and looking forward to, to, to today's discussion uh, with my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, and our entrepreneur, Zile. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Zule Fieren, uh, founder and chief energy officer of locumbase.com. Uh, Locumbase is a software as a service platform that connects freelance medical professionals to hospitals, practices, medical centers, pharmacies, uh, when it is needed most. Uh, our mission is to empower healthcare professionals, um, healthcare workers to really earn their worth and to empower practices to optimize the business of healthcare. Thanks, Lizzie. Okay, so to, to open up the panel, we're gonna start with an icebreaker and we'd like some audience participation at the same time. So I'm gonna ask our panel a question uh, and just to give us a one word answer. And attendees, if you can get involved by uh, giving us your response in the chat box and also to let us know if you're a VC or an entrepreneur kind of when you answer that question. So first one, how many years have you been in VC um, and Delay in your case, entre an entrepreneur? So uh, what, feels, what, what feels like 50, but then I look really good for my age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say in, in all seriousness with a 
bigger businesses, the, I would say the, the last, where are we now, 2021, um, seven, six, six years, seven years. Uh, but you know, if we go back to my to my uh, sticker auctioning business when I was eight years old, um, <laughs> there's a bit of math to do there. It's definitely a story there. Um, Kit. I think from a pure VC perspective, probably about 15 years. Um, I was in the corporate for about two, two or three. I was in, pri in private equity in Johannesburg for about four or five and then into banking. But banking, I, I was banking high growth um, sort of owner managed businesses. So I think that's where my love for entrepreneur and VC started. And, and then I joined Mark Shuttleworth's Heavy Dragons Fund in 20, 2007. And since then it's been us as a team. Cool, so a long time. Uh, Ian? Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting question because the one thing with most of the South African um, managers is we, we ourselves are entrepreneurs having started our own funds. So we, we often, we don't get the credit where the credit is due. Uh, we, we, we too sometimes have to stress a bit around making payroll and dealing with regulators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in financial services, I've been pretty much in my, my entire working life. I'm a bit younger than I look. So um, I, I, quite the opposite to the 50 years, I look pretty good. I'd say 15 years and I don't look so good, unfortunately. Um, so 15 years, started off in banking, worked uh, pretty much across Africa and the rest of the world, and then focused in the investing space, particularly well, focused in VC for about six years now. Cool, thank you. And I see we've got a few people uh, commenting in the comments. So we have Paul, who's been in investment for 10 years. We've got Gregory, who's an entrepreneur, and he's been uh, in the space for 20 years and one year in VC, welcome. Uh, and Ross, who's been in the VC man fund management space for five and a half years. Um, uh, Paul, correction, an entrepreneur since, since 2008, three startups and, and one exit. Uh, and Nimlan, BCPE for seven years. Cool, so same same structure for the next one. Uh, one word to describe your VC or as Elaine, your case, entrepreneurial journey thus far. Uh, yeah, I'm going to choose wild. Um, I'll uh, go first, I'll just go, it's been wild. Yeah. <laughs> in the best <laughs> ways, but also in very, very hard ways. So wild. Cool, hopefully um, we can get into that a bit more later. Ian. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll use the word topsy-turvy um, and where that comes from is uh, often people ask what, what's it like uh, being in the, in the VC space in South Africa and Africa and I say it's often like living in, in the world of Dr. Zeus where you read the business day one day and it's sort of all doom and gloom and the economy is doing badly and people are losing their jobs um, and companies you know aren't growing and obviously in our space it's quite, quite different where um, fortunately, um, you know, uh, particularly in the technology space on, on the continent, things are kind of scaling quite quickly. Um, obviously, a lot more investments is coming our way, job creation, high growth, etc. So it's, it's quite a strange word, topsy-turvy, but it very much comes from how I feel. Um, it's like we're living in this sort of alternative doctor's use universe. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Good. Uh, celebratory. So um, it's a long journey and not everything has definitely been, uh, been uh, reasons to celebrate. But um, because of that, we celebrate the milestones along the way. So um, it's been a whole lot of fun and met the most amazing people. But yeah, if I can describe my VC career, it, and it doesn't mean we've only had successes, but it has been celebratory, just celebrating the journey. I like that one. We're getting some, some good stuff coming in from the audience here. I've got insightful, humbling, volatile with lots of exclamations, an adventure, hectic, not linear, not for the faint-hearted, dynamic, character building, and celebratory. Um, that was your one, Kit. Um, cool. Last one. How many exits have you had to date? So, Leigh, do you want to start again? Uh, well, my, I would say my exits in... in, in three small projects. Um, I've had successful exits in the sense of I didn't spend much money to do them, so I got a bit of money out of it. Um, the business that, that my partner and I started before Locum Base, we're actually currently, um, well, I'm not involved in it anymore, but they're currently in the process of um, exiting there as well. So 
three tiny ones and one one less tiny one on the way. Awesome, Ian. Uh, so we've had three exits, um, two to incoming investors in later rounds, and then one to a uh, US-based trade buyer. Kit? You're on mute. We've had about 12, <laughs> and we've had about, had about 12 exits, but um, not, you know, exits doesn't always mean success, but we, we, we've really had five which were which were note, noteworthy to the likes of Visa, Garmin, Gen Electric, um, Uber Eats, and most recently um, FM Systems. Um, so all of those were, were, were great because they're to, to US-based businesses and it's, it's, it's just the experience and all that. But then um, we also had a management buyout um, back to the, you know, where, where we wanted to gun for exit and the entrepreneur said, look, I'm not finished with the journey. Can I not buy you guys out? And um, we, we managed to do that at a, at a, a few times money. And that we, we, we learned a lot about the fact that you also don't always have to go for these rock star exits and we'll go into that um, later on. We've had about two failures and one, you know, all like, yeah, let's fail where, it's, where it didn't create a return or didn't create a profit. And, um, and then one or two others, which were very small and, and, and that, but yeah, that's the, that's the journey so far. Cool, thank you. So that's going to be uh, cool to get some of the lessons that you guys have learned, um, particularly geared on the ones, the failures that you've been talking about. There's always uh, always interesting lessons to learn. Um, and from our panel, we've got four, three, uh, one nominal, two good, plus one good secondary result um, and a combination of success. Uh, and negative at 10. So we've also got um, some good experience uh, with our attendees. So to kick us off, we have seen significant growth in venture capital investments over the last 10 years with the South African Venture Capital Asset Class as at the end of 2020 invested in 841 active deals, as well as a steady growth in exits over the last five years with 42 exits in 2020. Um, there's a perception in the market that there is a lack of ex exits in South Africa. Is this truth or is this fiction? And what do you anticipate that we will see in the coming years? So open panel uh, for whoever has comments to that one. I can maybe maybe start. Um, I think it's a little bit of both uh, in terms of truth and fiction to sit on the fence on that one. It's definitely, as you can see from the survey results, it's definitely not true that there aren't exits, you know, and um, uh, South Africa has a very interesting structure in terms of how how the VC industry works, how the corporates play into that into that quite well. In terms of that, we have a very established um, stock exchange, very established businesses in banking, in healthcare, in you know, if you think about the big four and the Capitex and the Discovery Health and the Bedvests and you know, and if you overlay all of all of that into a, a very interesting dynamic market where we are mostly investing in B two B businesses, businesses to business or B to small B, just because our, um, you know, we are not China or America or where there's there's so many consumers that it's very it's easier there to and so much funding to chasing these things to make B two C businesses. So if you if you kind of look at the structure of our industry, a lot of these corporates are actually you know, basically m and is the new R&D, you know, so instead of, of, and a lot of the corporate innovation happening at the top of those very dynamic big corporates that we have, looking at this space to say, well, you know, let's insource innovation, let's acquire businesses. And when it, whether it's, you know, macro or mass mart or, you know, like the, there's, there's, you know, MMI, there's so, so many deals, which are maybe not your hundred million dollar exits, but they're happening and, and, and that, you know, then there's obviously the international ones, but is it, is it enough to really call it an industry or is it enough to, to say, well, it is a, it is a, it is a lays, it's worth a while to kind of build a business with only exit in mind um, is, 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 is the question, you know? So I think there's a, there's a healthy, growth still needed and we are all building that together, but um, therefore entrepreneurs, need to build to build you know to build to build sustainable businesses you know they can't rely on this fact that someone mythically will acquire yeah i mean maybe just to add to that i guess i mean 
we always just need to take a step back. Um, this is still quite a young sector. So it was quite interesting from the VC survey, how many, um, let's call it first time managers have, have um, come to the fore over the last couple of years, as opposed to those who've been around for five plus years. And it's obviously great to see so many new managers come in. It's additional capital, um, skills, expertise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it is still a young, a young sector. What, what is on our side is, is pretty much all the growth metrics on our side. Um, you know, as I said, more managers coming to the fore, uh, more investments being made. And then as Kurt correctly said, more exits um, uh, year, year on year um, that are taking place. Um, but I mean, I guess, the word exit is quite an interesting one. I mean, it's easy to exit a company. Um, you know, the, the question is, have you exited at, at, a, at a profit? Um, so it's quite interesting when someone says, you know, can you exit? I say, look, I'm pretty sure we can exit everything. Investors may not be particularly happy with the result. Um, but I, I guess what, what we've seen, which is probably something that hasn't been captured in the survey, which we find the most interesting and, and probably, um, uh, telling telling factor which has changed over probably the last two to three years is the amount of foreign investment that is taking place in both the South African and African startup sector. Um, so the way we look at kind of uh, strategically positioning our companies for exit, um, you're pretty lucky if you just wake up in the morning, you build a business and some guy from, let's just say, using case example of China, you know, Google's you and says, right, I'm going to invest in the South African business. Um, I know nothing about South Africa. I know nothing about you, what you do. And I know nothing about your market. Um, you really have to think far ahead and say, right, if I'm building this business and I want to exit to a Chinese trade player for argument's sake, you need to do everything in your power to get in there in, in their line of sight. And that takes several years. Um, and one of the things that, these, most of these trade players have internationally is they actually have their own VC arms. So if you look at some, some of the largest corporates internationally, it's starting to happen locally, but certainly internationally is they'll have their own corporate or VC backed team. Um, and something that we like to do is to try and bring them in, you know, pot potential, let's say trade buyers, if you're looking for a trade exit, to come into subsequent rounds. And that way you, they get to know you and you start to build that, that exit story. And the fact that we're seeing so many more internationals coming into the space locally, I think is very much one of the telling you know, factors to say, well, what will happen ultimately is that will help to facilitate um, uh, more exits along the way, but, but most importantly, meaningful exits. Um, I think the one thing that, that Kurt did touch on, one of the challenges is from a local ex exit point of view is that the market here is quite small. And from a trade buyer point of view, it's quite a captive market. So there's no real reason why a local trade buyer would really pay a premium. You know, I'm already the sort of entrenched player locally, either I buy you or, you know, if they're not very nice, they'll say, I'll compete with you and maybe quash you. Um, versus internationally, again, using the Chinese example, if, if what the startup does in South Africa is meaningful to them, they have customers they like, they have technology, market know-how, et cetera, that, is useful to them, they may say, well, I'm not going to try and compete with you, I'd rather acquire you. And that's where you may potentially get a premium. And again, it speaks to the fact that you're looking for profitable exits. So it's very much around the strategy, um, but yeah, uh, long story short, I, I think the fact that we are seeing so much more foreign investment, which is not happening across South Africa or, or necessarily other parts of Africa in all sectors. Um, and again, going back to the topsy-turvy, Board of Dr. Zeus, um, the spots or in spite of ourselves, uh, the VC sector here is really starting to flourish. Well, thanks, Ian. Anything from you, Zide? In my experience over the last 18 months, two years or so, we've really seen that corporates are really trying to work with early stage businesses, startups, scale ups. Um, that is doing something new, innovative in their space. So for us in the in the health space, um, it's it's interesting to see because the language of the corporate and the language of the startup is not the same. So we see that some of these corporates or, or traditionally, you know, private equity companies wanting to play in that VC environment to get in early almost. Um, 
and that's interesting because in in a way it's it's a lineup for a for an exit in a couple of years um so that's something that, that i've seen that's quite interesting not just with locum base and, and you know various people speaking to to us but um corporates that, that buy out bottles from pick, from pick and pay for instance and and really wanting to work with these these innovative companies um and also i agree i think more international funding will definitely come into south africa and africa um i think we just don't price ourselves high enough but then with more international money coming in i believe scale-ups and, and and you know further along businesses um are going to prefer taking international money so that expansion internationally can happen faster well thank you and um We've touched on it a bit, but the survey indicates that the majority of exits this year uh, came from exited portfolios uh, and disinvestment as a result, result of COVID-19. How do you anticipate that future VC exits are going to come about? I'll let Ian go first, maybe, on this one, but I do have some views. Um, yeah, no worries. So, look, I mean, it, it, a lot of it depends on, on, on what your strategy is. So... Um, sometimes when you meet a young entrepreneur, sort of blue starry eyed, and they say they want to ring the bell on the New York Stock Exchange, um, and not to say that that's not going to happen, but that's quite an ambitious goal if you're sitting in South Africa. Um, from our point of view, we're an early stage investor. So we're coming into companies where they post revenue, but they could have one customer. Um, the journey from, you know, one customer to let's say ringing the bell, you know, you, you read the headlines uh, of all these companies that IPO, these are not overnight successes. These are 15, 20 year successes. Um, so as an early stage investor, from our point of view, we look into hold investments for say around five years. Um, some, man some local managers, maybe seven years, uh, very few north of 10 years. And even if it's 10 years, it's very unlikely that if that's the, the strategy um, of the entrepreneur that the, 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 the early stage investor is going to be around there long enough. Obviously, if you're coming in later stage, say Series B and beyond, that may be realistic. Um, but sort of why I'm, why I'm painting that context is from our point of view as an early stage investor, if we aren't going to necessarily be around for long enough to ring the bell, using that example, um, you really have two main places you can exit. Obviously, through subsequent funding rounds, um, you know, it could be if you're coming in at post seed, it could be a series B or a series C or a series D, um, or to a trade to a trade player. Um, but realistically, I, I think, and, and Kier touched on it, um, what we, particularly in South Africa, do really well, um, be you a technology startup or a young business, we build really well for corporates. Um, so, you know, if you look at the JSC, we, we don't necessarily have, um, you know, a hundred uh, tier one blue chip corporates, but certainly our top 10, top 20 are by global standards, um, you know, uh, they can certainly compete, they're very credible. And we build really well for them. And what that allows us to do is says, well, if you can build for kind of the best in South Africa, um, a rule of thumb is that we could probably build, and we, we, we certainly from our experience, we have successfully built for, for some of the biggest names internationally. And ultimately as a B2B business, normally what lands up happening is your kind of your biggest customers land up acquiring you either they like your technology or your service a part of their customer segment that they require um so i think i think as we continue to build more for 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 particularly in south africa other parts of africa might be a little bit different a little bit b2 b2c uh orientated um for reasons we can go into if, 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 if the audience likes but yeah, I, I really see um, um, kind of uh, the trade exit as, as one of the more viable routes, certainly if, unless you're looking to hold on for 15, 20 years. Um, and then, of course, for, for subsequent funding rounds. So if, for example, you are helping to build a business and take it internationally, um, you know, locally, you can add a lot of value. You can almost get the company ship shape. But once you've, say, entered the U.S. and they're looking to service tier one corporates in the U.S., you may not be the most appropriate investor to be in the cap table. Um, you've sort of done 
you've done the bit that you needed to do, you've added your value. And, and again, subsequent funding rounds, you know, could be a, a B round, a C round, a D round, you may exit to, to incoming investors who can potentially add more value um, than you can. Yeah, I think it was in, as you touched on, interestingly, I don't think we all of a sudden going to to have a whole lot of IPOs. I mean, the JSE have, have some plans, alternative stock exchanges to to really look at this market and how do you create liquidity in a, a in in a, in a space. You know, this is a the the VC models are changing the the dis, disintermediation intermediation of, of of VCs crowdfunding. You know, there's quite a lot of financial products. If you think about where, where crypto and the blockchain is going and has gone. So the, there's definitely stuff happening outside of COVID, which will help liquidity in this, in this space, which doesn't need to follow the traditional path. I think it's very exciting that some of the um, portfolios are, are, have, have, have exited. Um, of other larger funds have taken portfolios over and so forth. I think it, it is by no means a mature industry, but it's at least signs of maturity. You know, it, it won't be, be, be long before some other elements of a healthy ecosystem also come into play. So I think in a way it's that, it's that leapfrogging approach. Um, I think COVID is, has, hasn't, hasn't really driven exits to a degree. It's more driven interesting um, stuff for portfolio companies because most of you know, v VCs around at least around this screen is investing in technology enabled or innovation driven businesses and therefore the whole drive towards forced acceleration of uh, digital transformation strategies by by corporates have suddenly made um, uh, you know that us or the tech startup less risky you know i had to I had to just laugh i mean you know we have a 12j business um or two actually 12j funds and before you know when we were introduced towards into investors as, as a panel it was always it was always a little bit different you know just always to say look you know there is certain ways this is tax break this is how it works then there are the 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 different ways you can do that you can invest in sort of more property underpinned um you know 12 j's you can invest in more asset leasing and those type of things and then basically but depending on your risk appetite way over on the risk scale over here are the are the tech guys you know if you want to have a tax break and um and invest in some weird and interesting stuff and it was quite interesting last year we were introduced sort of to the same panel where, where it was the other way around just to say and here are the are the tech guys, they've been in investing in this technology asset for the last this 13, 15 years. They understand it. It's not such a mystery for them. So this is the safe space now. So I was like, what the hell? Um, so, so I think one has to, one has to also go with the, with the, the ebbs and flows of, uh, of cycles, you know, so at, at the end of the day. But yeah, to answer your question there, Karen, I mean, I, I think it isn't going to be one thing. It's going to always be a little bit from South Africa driven by this B2B space. And it's going to be not a whole lot of IPOs. It's going to be a trade sale to strategic. I think we all play towards that game. You know, if, if we invest, there certainly has knife capital into a, into, I mean, if we had to invest in locum base, we will have a look at the space. We would have a look at who's acquiring elsewhere. We would see as, as you know, we would then start following and stalking the acquirers. We would make sure that Zulay's sell side data room is absolutely solidly in place. That you know she's seen at the right conferences to bump into some of the, some of these potential um, acquirers. White label the product maybe to to one or two of them. Make yourself um, as 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 that sort of scale up business very important to this acquirer. And then surprisingly, they they will pull you into their office one day and say, listen. I think we we have a good relationship going here. Uh, can we talk about a more, you know, trade sale to the strategic? But then they buy you for something, and that's what we will make sure that we all lay. And I mean, using now as an example because of the fact that you're on the screen, um, that we understand what are we going to sell. You know, is it going to be the fact that we have the majority of, of African locums? Is it is it our EBITDA margins or is it our scalable model or is it our access to other products or the fact that we are have this amazing intellectual property which we are protected or 
Is it the fact that we have a, a, a you know, a, a land grab strategy across emerging markets or, you know, and we will drive that message home and so that we can get a premium for that exit above what the company is actually worth on Excel or on paper at that time, you know, so, so, so I think there is a whole lot going on in terms of how do you tee up a trade sale to a strategic and that is what we at least do at, at Knife. So, so it's not surprising that mainly our exits are trade sales to strategics. So interesting, and, uh, and I'm loving your story. So they're definitely, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of people on the call in the VC space that that can uh, have similar stories uh, that they could share. Uh, Zule, anything anything you want to add? And now I'm finding it very interesting listening to to the perspectives of Kit and Ian from their side. Um, from my side, it, it it looks completely different um, as an entrepreneur, but also you know as a fairly green entrepreneur as well in, in the bigger the bigger spaces that I'm that I'm working in now. Um, but I'm also seeing that trend that Kit just mentioned, where the your big, biggest customer is probably going to be a a big leverage for you when somebody wants to, when you are at that stage of wanting to exit or wanting to sell your business or have it completely acquired by, by someone. Um, and building those strategic partnerships at the beginning to kind of line it up for later on, um, you know, it's part of, of our strategy. But um, again, as Kit also says, it depends on what, what is your strategy and what is it that you're actually gonna sell at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I, I, but it was interesting listening to Kevin Ian from, from that perspective. Awesome. Um, so particularly to Kiet and Ian, um, can you give us one example of an exit that you've been involved in um, and two to three lessons that uh, you've learned and that you're willing to share with our attendees? Who wants to go first? Oh, I, I don't mind going first. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, um, Zule is saying sort of a build, build to exit. So I guess, I guess, um, was it uh, Gary Player said that the, the, the more you practice, the luckier you get, but you, you, you can't discount uh, the luck factor. So our story, our story has quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of science, but a, a whole lot of luck in it. So in, in 2016, uh, we invested in a local creative research business. Um, and all the signs were really positive. Soon after we invested, they were finalists in the FMB Innovation Awards. Uh, they competed uh, representing Africa at the Startup World Cup in San Francisco. Um, and it was clear that the business was really going, going somewhere. Um, but all of this, we, 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 we still wouldn't have predicted where it landed up um, today. So at the time of investing, we couldn't claim that we were experts in the global research market where they played. Um, but the founders um, very much were. So they had a collective, you know, 20 years experience in the space, in particularly in the creative research space where they played. Um, and they used AI and technology um, to very much uh, change the way things were done in this creative feedback space. Um, and technology is an area we understand quite well. So that's one of the reasons we invested. Um, however, a few years into the, into, into the investment, um, what became quite clear was the business had focused on external feedback. Um, so that would be like a simple one would be uh, if you if you have a, a it could be a website or a, um, a, a TV advert where you went to external sort of people, you get external feedback by all crowdsourced through technology globally and you get all this clever, clever uh, research put together and a little bit of AI in, in between to predict um, certain feedback, et cetera. But what became quite clear was it was actually internal feedback that was much more important. So like what was happening with your customers or within your organization. And South Africa, as, as we, we have touched on, particularly in the consumer space is, is rather small compared to some other markets. Um, so we took a leap of faith. We um, actually set up a new business uh, in the US um, and uh, yeah, so a new business was formed um, and this business hit the ground running. We relocated the CEO, CEO to Atlanta um, and they were accepted onto the Techstars program there, um, which just as a sort of a 
segue or side note was the biggest challenge they had on tech stars was the other entrepreneurs or startups kept on trying to steal all our tech, uh, our tech talent. Um, they, they kept on saying how, how smart our guys were. And, you know, um, we, we were still paying them with rands, not dollars. So it was quite a challenge. Um, but in no time, yeah, the, this, uh, the business started to do really well. Uh, the feedback um, tools uh, quickly landed them pilots with some large US corporates. Um, and on the back of that, they started a process to raise financing uh, from US uh, VCs. Um, and sort of when this happened, three things, well, while this was happening, three things happened in that market. So this is, this is let's call it a bit of luck. So the science was reading the market, understanding the market, and getting them to the US quite successfully. Um, and then there were three things happening behind the scenes that we weren't particularly aware of. So, so and when I say we, us, the founders, et cetera. So this is where the luck comes in. Um, so firstly, a little company you may have heard of called MailChimp with uh, about 20 million business customers um, uh, actually sent out um, a survey to their 20 million customers, which is quite a lot of people saying, what is the one thing from a product development point of view that you'd like? Um, and overwhelmingly, the customer said, we would like a survey tool. So we, you, you know, you, we can communicate through you, but we don't know what our, what our custom, what our customers being their customers are actually thinking. Um, the second thing was, I sort of alluded to this, um, our business, uh, big team, they were, um, they were, uh, well, their customers were using the survey tool for external feedback, but their marketing departments and their human resource departments got a hold of the survey tool and were starting to use it for internal feedback. So that's not what it was designed for, but people were using it and they were paying for it. So we didn't complain. And then the third thing, which was probably the biggest luck of all of them was one of the um, other participants on the Techstars program just happened to have recently been acquired by MailChimp. Um, and they landed up introducing our business big team to MailChimp. And if you kind of take all the things I just said, the stars kind of aligned and big team said, hey, uh, MailChimp, we have a survey tool. Would you like, you know, would you like to invest? And MailChimp said, yes, we would like to invest. Um, and ultimately, um, fast forward to around June last year, um, post investment, MailChimp actually acquired big team. Um, and if any of you are a MailChimp user, probably at the end of last year, beginning of this year, you would have seen quite a few notifications around survey functionality, which is basically the business that we had invested in. Um, it's now being run by, by, by the founder um, of Big Team. So very much humble beginnings in sunny South Africa, now servicing about 20 million customers around the world. Um, so that's quite a, a nice story. Um, in terms of lessons learned, I've obviously spoke about don't discount luck. Um, and don't discount what, you know, value what you do know, but don't discount what you don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, on a serious note, I mean, it's absolute proof that South Africans, Africans, we can compete internationally. I mean, as I say, it's our technology now being rolled out into 20 million bus businesses around the world. Um, app, you know, hard rule back and support founders with subject matter expertise. And, and we use the word right to play quite a bit. Um, you know, we, we aren't experts in everything, but, but certainly founders uh, who, who come from you know, a certain sector or certain industry, hopefully they have the expertise, but very much the right to play. You know, what, what makes you special? What makes you stand out? Um, and then importantly, think strategically. So as Kurt said, um, it's not by luck that uh, Zule may bump into someone at a conference and you have to think strategically but, but you also have to be practical. Um, you never know what tailwinds or headwinds may be out there. Um, and yeah, as I said, never discount the role that can have. Good, interesting, interesting story. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go um, and, and, and maybe one of our favorite um, exits, mainly because it was also not in not in dollar numbers, but in times money, it sort of went to, to 13 times and, and you know, the VC magical 10 number, 10 times money is, 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 is good. So for us, it was, it was for that reason, amazing for Knife. Secondly, it was the last exit um, out of our HPD fund. So in essentially, you know, the way, you, you know, we have fund one, fund two, fund, fund three as, as venture capitalists, 
and <clears throat> because we're such a young industry, you know, there aren't, you know, many funds that have like really raised the fund, deployed the whole thing, exited all the investment and gave the whole fund back and, and, and basically wrapped it up with a bow around it and gave it back in this case to, to Mark Shuttleworth and, and, and had a, had a, had a great IRR. And, and so, 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 but anyway, the startup is, is a company called Order Talk. It did restaurant online ordering um, software in, in, and we invested in 20, 2000 and it was early, I think 2008 or nine, you know, so it was like a 10 year journey. So I think my first lesson is it takes time, you know, so therefore as African or South African investors, you have to price that in to, to how you, how, how your IRR is going to work. You know, so, I mean, the zone is four to seven years and, and some of our businesses have, have done that. But it obviously erodes IRR the longer it goes in, and, and it means you must be careful at what valuation you come in, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the lesson there. So invest in this business. They were just re really start up in a shared office space, three or four people with a dream and, a, and I think a million rands of revenue recurring um, annual at that point of time. And... Um, but we did it, and uh, you know, I think it was a nine million rand investment at the time. So we had to really build in build in some clawbacks and claw ins and structures to justify the valuation of it all. An idea was basically that restaurants focus on food ordering. We will focus on the back end of of when you know. Now, obviously, the industry is blown wide open, but there were no Uber Eats or none of that at that time. It was more just managing and scheduling the little scooters and, 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 and all that. And food is a complex item to buy. I mean, it's, it's time sensitive. It's not like buying a TV on take a lot. You know, it, it's, it's sometimes there's no mushrooms in that we're out of Avo. You know, there, there needs to be dynamic menu, you know, so, so, so that it is actually a complex problem to solve. Solved it, but realized the first thing in, in our due diligence is South African market's not big enough. You know, in, in where do people really have a mission in life to eat as much food and as much fast food as, as possible, as quickly as possible? Well, it's the U.S. So let's go. Let's go in. Uh, let's go there. Basically kick Patrick as a founder out of the out of the country and build the business that side obviously suited. And it was interesting. And I hope we're not trying to give that lesson, but maybe between the lines it's interesting. Same as, as Ian and them, you know, it helps with the intellectual property and, and the Reserve Bank, um, not not want to take a swipe at, at, at XCON today, but it makes it very difficult to exit businesses on from home soil. Um, and, and, and obviously that, that played all into our hands, built the business in the U S over a number of many years, had a few false starts towards exit, but then became very meticulous about and the second lesson is really have be prepared, you know, so, so you, you really need to have, if to justify a high valuation, you need to be able to sell, the next couple of years on that Excel spreadsheet. And to do that, you need to build revenue bridges. You have to have your pipeline, you know, and CRM systems dynamic. You have to have your three pager perfect, your pitch deck amazing, your sell side data room awesome, all your intellectual property, whether it's trademarks or codes, reviews, or however, there, there must be no is in the closet there in terms of how, how, you know, you had a founder in the beginning and he left and he didn't sign or he or she didn't sign a, IP assignment agreement. So none of none of things that can be picked up in a DD. So it took us but you know quite a while through the investment to 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 and that's why a VC partner, you know, if I can plug the industry is, is a good partner to have because pain in the butt sometimes, but we do do those things for a reason. Um, and 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 that reason is we want to make you rich, um, entrepreneur. And we're gonna be richer if 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 these things are in place than not. So the second lesson really is is because those things get interrogated. You know the 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 the, the data room lists from a, on the sell side side. If if it's a you know Excel KKR backed acquirer or, or whatever, they know what they're doing much more than us around this screen. And um, and and we better have uh, have all our ducks in a row. And then basically the, the the you know when when we went through the exit to to Uber Eats. I think the other lesson is, is yeah, you know, it's not so much luck as that sometimes what you build and what you think you're building is not why you're going to get acquired. So we can be all as clever as we want around a partner universe. These are all the people that we, be, 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 let's approach them. You know, we work generally with an advisor if it comes to that. But in this case, you know, we built this amazing system, recurring revenue, 
facilitates the online ordering process in the me in the process of doing that um, plugged into the back ends of the apis of all the point of sales systems in the us and in europe or well, not all of them but most of them so we had the point of sale systems back ends covered and uber looked at this place thinking well uber eats need to aggressively grow and they're going to have to build apis and 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 stuff into every point of sale system or they can just acquire a company that has it all in and they acquired us for that which was sort of for us a by the by and basically didn't really care about our business model of of, of building more and more restaurants onto our um, order talk system so it's quite a good and a sad story at the same time but we don't care the entrepreneur sits in vegas on his second startup he doesn't care he, he, and um and 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 basically everyone's happy Awesome. Thanks, Kit and Ian. Those are great stories. And I think we could probably have a whole panel discussion on taking uh, investments offshore and then exiting those investments offshore. Um, cool. So we uh, are running out of time, but we've got a number of uh, statements that have come through from our attendees. So we're going to put those up. Um, and if I can get from our three panelists in just an agree or disagree on the statements, and then if I can get from our attendees a vote on which of these five statements you think is the best, um, and that um, that uh, statement will, will win the prize. So the first one is there will be more new VC firms in the next five years than the previous 10 years combined. Agree or disagree? Could you assign that? I'd say agree. See, I, I come prepared your, to these things. <laughs> I've got two agrees. What do I have from Ian? Uh, uh, I'll say. Yeah, I'll make, make my. I'll have, make I'll have to make my, my disagree sign. So None of us did our homework. <laughs> didn't know I had to make a sign. Sorry. There's a sign. That one. What is what is that? What does that say? Agree. We've got three. We've got three agrees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool, the next one, um, and there will be a poll that opens up once we've gone through all five of the questions uh, for, for the attendees to vote. So in the next five years, more job creation will come from businesses invested by VC firms and big listed corporates. Agree or disagree? If you can say more new jobs being created, I would agree. But this question as it is, Corporates employ a lot of people. I would, I would, I would, I would disagree. Not because, not because startups won't create more jobs than all the big listed corporates, but not all startups are VC backed. So, so um, yeah, in, and specifically if we then to take this into South Africa because of our industry, I would say the statement is almost true. But if it's you know VC is a small part of a startup's growth journey, so. Yeah, so if we changed VC firms for, for SMEs yeah, uh, or then, startups, then it, we'd be in a different then space. Agree. <laughs> cool. Ian, agree or disagree? Um, yeah, so I made a sign. I'm going to use my sign. So dis disagree. Disagree, cool. So we've got, very we've got good three disagrees on this, <laughs> on this well, statement. If I was smart, yeah. I could have been a doctor. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, I mean, the one thing is that I would like to say is, is the one thing particularly in the technology space is is the skilled jobs that are coming out of vc backed firms so you know we're retaining and attracting skills probably at a higher rate than some of the big corporates um so you know job creation is, is quite relative but, um you know when we talk about skilled sticky sticky jobs um that's probably where vc backed businesses are the most exciting Cool. Third question. We have seen the worst of the impact of COVID-19 on portfolio companies. Agree or disagree? Sure. I think so. Agree. We got an agree from kids. Agree from Zile, Ian. Um, sure. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so again, on the technology side, I mean, because of the rapid adoption and use of technology as a result of the crisis, a lot of our portfolio companies have done better. So sort of like, I don't think I'd agree or disagree because the net effect may be that, that you know, a lot of companies have done really well. Um, is that going to stop? So I don't think that's going to stop. 
but if you, I suppose, a traditional business, hopefully, hopefully the worst is over. So if it's a traditional business, I'll say, uh, agree. <laughs> cool. So we got three agrees. Uh, fourth one. So just quickly what happened, what, what, uh, just on, on that, with COVID and the startups, what, what's happened is while the technology was there, there was a bit of a lag because all the corporates have had budgetary constraints, you know, so it's fantastic that you could, in, in our case, you know, have um, cold chain management software and hardware startups and, and think, well, that's amazing. But when the corporates themselves, the hospitals themselves have no elective surgery and stuff, they don't have budget to buy. So that lag effect is coming through in a, in a better way now. And, and as um, Ian also said, for some of the startups, and we luckily have one, Snaplify in online education. I mean, they just they just hit next year's budget already. Um, but that's just, that's just luck. And okay. number four, there is a lack of investors, angels interested in that very early and risky stage. Agree or disagree in South Africa, I presume? Agree? I think there are more now than there's ever been, Agree. but there's still a lack. <laughs> cool. So we've got three three agrees on that one. Uh, number five, the last one. Investments in Africa startups will continue to break records next year as global investors continue to hunt for higher yielding assets. Oh, we got two very fast agrees there. Definitely. <laughs> I'm, what do we I'm got there? Say, I'm gonna, it's an agree. Okay. But I'll, I'll caveat, even though Ross is a very wise man, I don't want to argue with him, is obviously that still depends on, on uh, quantitative easing. So the hunt for yield is very much a function of liquidity in the system. So for our sake, it's good if it continues, but it's obviously out of our control what the Fed, uh, what the Fed does. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so you'll see there's a poll up for voting for the best state, uh, statement. So one to five, so if you can uh, give in your vote there. And just as my last question, because I think this is a very exciting one, um, will both the panelists and attendees predict how many exits there'll be in 2021 and why? And we're going to save these and bring them up next year at the, the survey session that, that Safka is going to hold and, and see who was right. So just quick responses. How many exits in 2021 and why? Can I say more than one? <laughs> that is not an answer. <laughs> so we, we, we're working on an exit now. So I'll, 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 I'll stick to one. One is, one, is, one is my prediction, at least one. Um, one in 2021. <laughs> no, we, we discussed this. I said, I don't know how to answer this one. And yeah, I said, at least one. At least one. At least one. At least one. Make a prediction. <laughs> what was it for? What, it was 31, right? For, for the last uh, for two, the su survey launch today. This, uh, it was uh, 43. So I'm going to say 50. We're going to get to 50. I'm going nice. to be positive here. Go for round number 50. Yes. I'm going to say 43. 43, same, same number I'll, as uh, 2030. I'll, I'll change mine to 50 because entre entrepreneurs are a lot wiser than us. No, but you have to, you have to, have, you have to have a different number than delay so that you can win the prize. Uh, the, the bottle yeah, of yeah. champagne. That, 50 that, and a half. I'll say 50. 50 and a half. 51. 51. 51. I think, I hope you guys are right. But I think the reason why I think it's possibly the same as this year because there, there were one or two portfolio acquisitions i think that make those numbers slightly slightly um it's right um but potentially slightly higher than it than it could be but hopefully i'm i'm wrong and it's 70 um but uh, be it'll be it'll be at least the same as as this year and i'm gonna go for the same awesome cool thank you so much for your time thanks Kiet Ian Zule. it's been a really insightful session and uh, really appreciate your time and thanks to all our attendees um, for attending the session we hope you you thank learned you something from our our panelists here Karen, to you, uh, panelists, thank you so much this has been a wonderful conversation uh, really interesting there's some good questions that came through that we didn't get to in this power hour uh, we'll ask our panelists if they have the time to maybe look at those questions and we'll send some results through but also thank you to the audience for your engagement
And the winner of the uh, virtual ticket to the SAFCA conference on the 15th of November is Mr. Ross Genvi, uh, who received 45% of the votes. Congratulations, Ross. Um, the SAFCA team will be in touch um, and we will get you registered for the SAFCA conference um, virtually. For those that are interested in the conference, please go to our website, safca.ca.za, and at the top, there's a, there's a conference tab. Thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed this afternoon. Hope you all have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, stay warm, and uh, we'll see each other soon. And uh, looking forward to seeing where those predictions land up next year. Have a great evening, everyone.